we're all seeking that deep feeling of being enough just as we are not yeah. based on what we're doing or not doing yeah. just in that pure self-expression and so many of us i think continue these cycles some of us on the other end of the spectrum it's not achieving it's underachieving yeah. right keeping ourselves in the backdrop keeping ourselves so kind of out of any focus of attention because in childhood that was the safest thing that we could do to maintain our connections mm -hmm. and then ultimately right we're, when we're not just being who we are living in our self-expression we aren't going to feel fulfilled. Yeah. We're probably not going to feel connected to the relationships or the world around us yeah. because we're not. We are yeah. disconnected from that intrinsic and whole aspect of our being. As we've been talking about becoming conscious, right? What is happening in my body? What is the meaning that my mind is assigning? The more you notice the same habitual meanings, right? Based in the same or coming from the same kind of sort of moment, mm -hmm. the same shifts in physiology. I talk a lot about the different states of nervous system that I mentioned earlier. And I offer a checklist uh, in the book in terms mm -hmm. of what that maps onto in terms of your body. Like how can I drop in and notice when I'm in that eruptor mode or when I'm in yeah. that detached or the distractor mode, right? So then I can make sense of what is mine. Now that's mm -hmm. not to say if an environment or a relationship is ultimately creating that threat-based reaction, right, is making me feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. While it's, right, not necessarily, you know, kind of something we want to give away, we want to maintain our power by maintaining the choice to change that. Assuming that this person is going to be violating in whatever way, you know, and this isn't saying that we're responsible for their choices and their actions, absolutely not, but we can become responsible for putting and setting the boundary that we need to make yeah. sure that we're able to retain that safety. Yeah. which might mean removing ourselves from that environment or from that relationship in childhood, you know, up until around age seven, age eight, our brain, you know, in its emotional immature state isn't able to naturally zoom out, right. And kind of hover above, like we do gain the ability in adulthood to do and understand that actions don't translate to our inherent right. worthiness and that yeah. people do act in many different ways because mm -hmm. of many external factors that have nothing to do with us at all. Mm. A childhood, that state of development is what's called an egocentric state. Mm. And simply what that means is the child is, and the whole world in their belief revolves around the child. So when things happen or don't happen in their environment or with, within their relationships, because their mind is always seeking to make meaning, make sense of the world around mm. them, as all of our minds are doing, they will land on, I caused this event. This yeah. person is unavailable to me because there's something unlovable or unworthy within me who I intrinsically am. Mm -hmm. And the more they then assign that meaning without these beautiful moments where you're yeah. saying, no, that has nothing to do with you, right? This might have been what caused my reaction or mm -hmm. even you're doing this action, but it doesn't reflect on you. Yeah. This is why so many of us grow into adulthood with those deep rooted beliefs that I am unworthy that I am unlovable. And then usually what follows is um, the concept of, of what I call a conditioned self. Tell me what you're thinking, give me what you're drinking. Tell me what you're thinking, give me what you're drinking. You and me, we got something special, baby. You all right, hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are sitting down with repeat guest, uh, Dr. Nicole Perra, the holistic psychologist for her second visit to the show. Uh, she is here today to talk to us about her brand new book, How to Be the Love You Seek, uh, Break Cycles, Find Peace, and Heal Your Relationships. And I was fortunate to get an advanced copy of this book. I'm about three quarters of the way through, and it's incredible. So Dr. Nicole, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for taking time for us. Glenn and community, thank you for having me back. I'm honored to be here. Absolutely. So first things first, can you give us like the bird's eye view of this book? Because when I hear relationships and love, like immediately romantic relationships, and although that's a huge focus of the book, uh, there's also other relationships that this book can apply to. So maybe give us like the elevator pitch, the bird's eye view. What's the book about? Who's it for? Absolutely. I, I appreciate uh, this question because I do agree when, especially with love being in the title, uh, I think a lot of us jump right to, well, romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. So if we're not in one, um, it might not feel like it's going to resonate, though, just in general, um, the book, as I was sharing with you a little bit beforehand, before mm -hmm. we hit record, it's really informed by my own lived experience in and out of all different types of relationships. 
family, platonic, romantic, of course, and mm -hmm. also informed by my practice, um, my more traditional practice several years ago, where I did a lot of couples and family work. I loved mm -hmm. experiencing, observing, and trying to be impactful uh, in creating change <laughs> in the, di the dynamics between, between human beings. And mm -hmm. what I saw reflected in that couple's work, that family work was really similar to what I was seeing in individual work that I wrote about and how to do the work, mm -hmm. um, which was simply, we struggle. We struggle to create change. We have, many of us are carrying as reflected in this subtitle, dysfunctional patterns, dysfunctional cycles. Um, within our relationships with other people. So when I sought to understand why I wasn't able to be really impactful, why the sessions that I was having with with many couples wasn't able to create change in those dynamics, um, mm -hmm. I landed really on how important, you know, as is my previous or all of my work, the body uh, mm -hmm. is in in storing a lot of our dysfunctional habits and how many of us are even overstepping the first foundational relationship that we're all in, even if you're not in a committed partnership, mm -hmm. um, which is the relationship with ourself. So when I really dove into those dynamics, understanding the nervous system, understanding our neurobiology, our physiology, um, then I was really able to understand why, again, so many of us are stuck, um, mm -hmm. why the first shift that we can and could begin to make and need to make is re reconnecting with who mm -hmm. we really are so that then our relationships could become more authentic and more fulfilling. Yeah. So there's like a natural progression to the books that you've read. Like it starts in one place and leads us to this point. Yeah. Is there absolutely. something, is there something beyond this one that have you, have you thought about the next step? You don't have to, don't give us any, any sneak peeks, but have you thought about the next step? I love it. I love, I actually too get asked, um, is there a sequence? Like, do mm -hmm. I have to read, uh, how to do the work, yeah, read yeah. the workbook that came out last year? to then be able to read this book. And while I think it's a natural progression yeah. as we're on our, on our own healing journeys, we're still struggling in our relationships or mm -hmm. we want to create the same change within our relationships. I really wrote each of these books uh, to be standalone. Mm -hmm. So many people, individuals I'm imagining are just picking up this book and my hope is that they gain value and benefit uh, transforming their relationship with their self and others. And actually, yes, um, while I am giving myself time <laughs> to live and breathe all things relationships now, uh, I do have a bit of an idea in mind for the next step um, on our journey uh, and in terms of what that could look like in, in a book project. But I'm going to stay focused on this right now. That's the little it. overachiever One in thing me at a time. is going to stay grounded <laughs> and enjoying all that is this relationship book. And I will dive into that creative project somewhere down the line. Awesome. I love it. All right. So let's start with some uh, childhood stuff. A nice light topic. We'll, we'll jump oh, into yes. to, to start it off. Uh, but can you talk to us about the a little bit about the impact, like you said earlier, about our, our childhood having on our relationships that we have in adulthood. Because again, like this goes way, way beyond just romantic relationships, right? Because like the reality is that our own, our childhood can have such an impact, not only on how we relate to our partner, but how we relate to our parents, our bosses, our managers, our employees, our children. And like you said before, like even how we relate to, to the most important relationship, which is with with ourselves. And so maybe take us like a little bit into that. Um, and if you're okay with it, maybe even tell us a little bit about how your childhood has shown up in your present day relationships and what that's looked like for you to kind of navigate through some of that stuff as well. And just even starting from that first foundational relationship, mm -hmm. it's in those early childhood environments and relationships where we're dependent on other people for our physical care that we really learn those those daily skills or yeah. many of us lack then those daily skills if we had parents who weren't physically present if we had parents who weren't emotionally present and able to attune to our different signals of distress i mean even just think of an infant right when they cry yeah. Yeah. there's something that is upsetting them whether it's mm -hmm. a physical need um, they're hungry, they're tired, they have to, they need to be changed, mm -hmm. or whether it's an emotional need, right? They're experiencing a stress or an upset. And in absence of having more consistently than not, of course, I don't want parents to think it's the one off where they were not physically present for whatever reason or not able mm -hmm. to be emotionally present, though, when they're not consistently able uh, to have that figure present to them, attuned to their needs. Mm -hmm. They are not able to have a calm, grounded nervous system. So when they are in that state of distress, they're being rocked or or soothed in some way. Um, what will happen then is they will adapt. We're all very adaptive creatures and yeah. ultimately will then continue to lean on those same habits in terms of how we care 
for our own physical needs, how we tend to our own emotional needs, our ability to regulate, self-regulate, turn to others and receive the care and support, those moments of co-regulation. And then that ultimately becomes the imprint or the blueprint for how we show up when we're relating to other people. Do we have space in our relationships for our physical needs, especially in the moments when they might differ from someone else's physical mm -hmm. needs, right? Do we know who we are and are we able to express ourselves emotionally, our thoughts, our feelings, our interests, our curiosities, our just mm -hmm. natural way of being? And again, the large majority of us, which is why I, I truly believe most of my work, um, if not all of my work, especially this, this work, can benefit because I, I have yet to meet an adult who has had that consistent, secure, safe present. And again, of no fault for many of our parents. Mm -hmm. Many of us were raised um, by past generations who you know, showed up desperately trying to break the habits in the childhood and not repeat many of the behaviors that they had experienced in their own past. Though all of this, back to this idea of the body, is wired into us. Yeah. So even with the best of intentions, very few of us had that l level of safe and secure attunement that we needed. Mm -hmm. So we did adapt in some way. We did modify what we shared with other people, how we expressed ourselves emotionally, and just generally how we're showing up in the world individually mm -hmm. and or within our relationships. Yeah. I think it's really good cool. what you said earlier about how, you know, especially for parents, like looking at their children now. Like we, we become aware of our own baggage. Like I know for me, I've become aware of a lot of things that I've picked up my own traumas in the past. I think, look at my daughter, my like, good Lord, I don't want to pass any of this on to her. But there, and there's so many instances where like, I'll do something. I'm like, shoot, like, you know, I, why did I respond that way? Like, why did I do that to her? Like she can need counseling down the road, she can need therapy, all this stuff. But then I think to myself, well, like you said, it's about, it's about the pattern. And I think that there are those one-offs that everybody it happens like you just you have a day you have a moment it's a one-off situation but I think like my daughter and I think our kids are going to remember down the road like the patterns that we instilled in them not so much the one-off experiences but like you said everybody's going to pick up stuff like we all have our baggage and you nobody's going to be perfect nobody's going to come through childhood unscathed <laughs> absolutely I just want to just speak really quickly um why in those moments we can't show up how we want to, mm -hmm. right? Or, or translate insight into action, right? I wanna break this habit, it didn't work in my own childhood. I lived the consequences of that, so I'm gonna do differently. So why is it so difficult in yeah. those moments? Why do we become reactive and mm -hmm. more or less lose control, right? Mm -hmm. we, we stop gaining the ability or we lose access to the ability to translate that insight, to do the new thing. And again, that's because for many of us, these are wi wired in habits mm -hmm. and something is coming up emotionally that's dysregulating our nervous system and in terms of a physiological sense we do lose access mm -hmm. to that grounded conscious presence that ability to see right the consequences of this action into the future and to show up in choice we drop down to a yeah. very animalistic right a lot of people call it the lizard brain yeah, driven right. <laughs> reactivity cycle yeah. and i just like to share that physiology because i know and you know not having children myself though knowing i've said and done many things in all of my relationships that I don't mean to say or do losing control in that moment, I think it can be very shameful uh, yeah. for us in those yeah. moments to see rep or that repetition um, of the patterning. And just to speak to the point then, when those natural moments are going to happen, mm -hmm. because even as we begin the work, we become and you know use all of this beautiful conscious awareness and insight until we rewire ourselves. Mm -hmm. and practice these grounded moments of presence, which as you'll read in the book, really do begin with caring for our physical body and teaching our nervous system how to tolerate more and more stress. So really simplifying it, those moments will still happen, yeah. even if we have all of this insight and awareness. What is so helpful in those moments is not to act like it didn't happen, right? Our children are so capable of understanding. And when we as parents, as loved ones, right, in any relationship, when we come back, when we do ground, when we do gain that grounded sense of, you know, awareness and presence back, acknowledging what happened, mm -hmm. taking accountability for even those one offs, that's not only going to give our loved ones and our children, whoever they might be, a new awareness of what happened, so that their mind won't make sense of it, that it's somehow related to them or their fault or 
they were bad in some way, as we yeah. will do in childhood, as children will do, right? It will also teach and model personal accountability, what it does look like and feel like as all of us as adults will continue to have those moments of, you know what, I, I did the thing yeah. that was hurtful to you in some way. And I'm able to take my responsibility by acknowledging what had happened. And of course, by staying committed to breaking those habits. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When you can own it, I think it makes such a huge difference for you and for the other person. And I think also to separate, like you said about, it's not just, I, I did this thing, but I'm not this thing. I think that's a huge distinction because many of us, like even me growing up, like the different, the baggage I realized I've carried, I let it define like who I am, but that's not who I, who I am. And I had this conversation with my daughter the other day because she did something that was just really crazy. And she said to me, like later on, she's like, you know, I, I really made a mistake and I'm sorry that I did that. And, you know, I was really bad. And I said, no, no, no. I said, you're not bad. I said, you might've made a mistake. You might've done something that wasn't the best decision. I said, but you're not a bad person. I said, I do that all the time. And it led to a really good conversation. And I've gone to her as well and had those conversations. When you own up to it, it models something really, I think, special for her that hopefully she'll carry forth with her into adulthood. That's so beautiful. Um, yeah. I had chills, Glenn, when you were when you were sharing that. And again, just to go into a little bit of our developmental process mm -hmm. in childhood, you know, up until around age seven, age eight, our brain, you know, in its emotional immature state, isn't able to naturally zoom out, right? And kind of hover above, like we do gain the ability in adulthood to do and understand that actions don't translate to our inherent right. worthiness and that yeah. people do act in many different ways because mm -hmm. of many external factors that have nothing to do with us at all. Mm. A childhood, that state of development is what's called an egocentric state. Mm. And simply what that means is the child is, and the whole world in their belief revolves around the child. So when things happen or don't happen in their environment or with, within their relationships, because their mind is always seeking to make meaning, make sense of the world around mm. them, as all of our minds are doing, they will land on I caused this event. Yeah. This person is unavailable to me because there's something unlovable or unworthy within me who I intrinsically am. Mm -hmm. And the more they then assign that meaning without these beautiful moments where you're yeah. saying, no, that has nothing to do with you, right? This might have been what caused my reaction. Or mm -hmm. even if you're responding like you just beautifully did to, to your child, right? You're doing this action, but it doesn't reflect on you. Yeah. This is why so many of us grow into adulthood with those deep rooted beliefs that I am unworthy, that I am unlovable. And then usually what follows is if I, or I'm unworthy when I do this, mm -hmm. I'm only lovable when I do that. And then that becomes, as I talk about in the book, um, the concept of, of what I call a conditioned self, mm -hmm. right? This very conditioned way that's become our habit way of being all based in this idea of how I had to show up, who I had to be yeah. to maintain those connections on which I was so wholeheartedly dependent on. And again, it really does go back to our developmental inability to zoom out. Though once we have that belief ingrained in us in adulthood, because it operates outside of our awareness, for many of us, it drives this very conditioned way of being where we keep showing up yeah. in this way because we think that, this, that that is the only way to sustain our connections or to be loved by other people. That's a really good perspective. I wish, I mean, I all can look back. I wish that someone would have been able to speak that into me because there's so many instances I can even think of in my childhood where I'm like, man, I'm a bad person. I shouldn't have done that. You know, like that kind of thing that, that I carried that with me and I made it my identity as opposed to just a thing that I did. So that's a really helpful perspective. Thank you. Uh, piggybacking off of, of that, what about like, let's talk about like childhood trauma and how that can affect not just the body, like like you said, but also the mind. Because I feel like Science seems to be becoming more like readily available that like the body holds on to trauma. There's lots of books, like even the local bookstore the other day, I was perusing through some books and there's a lot of different books about that. And people seem to have like an understanding, um, you know, that the, the, the trauma that we experience as children, it, it carries forth in our bodies and it kind of comes out in all sorts of ways. But there's also the mind, right? Because the mind is a powerful thing. And I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that like there's probably things that happen to us stored in our minds that we can't really even access on a regular basis because maybe we buried it, we stuffed it away, but it's still in there. And I think it still pops up at, in really the most inopportune times <laughs> in our lives and in our relationships. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about 
that aspect of things, childhood trauma, how that works its way out in the body and the mind. Trauma is, and again, this was a shift in the field. Mm -hmm. Trauma isn't necessarily what happens to us. Mm. Trauma is the impact on us yeah. of what's happening or not mm. happening around us. And that's a, that's an, a huge shift, yeah. right? Because then that allows a conversation about our own, you know, unique physiological body's ability mm. to deal with stress and upsetting emotions, which again goes back to whether or not we had that safety and security in our external environment and within our relational environment in childhood. So when we understand, like I was sharing earlier, I've yet to meet an adult that's not carrying some of the imprint of a, a traumatic experience in childhood because we were raised by generations who didn't have this information, yeah. who for many decades, parents thought that there were only physical needs to tend to. There wasn't a conversation about emotions and co-regulation and the importance of emotional expression in yeah. childhood. And we were, many of us were raised in generations who didn't have the support they needed, the financial, the emotional, right? Their own ability to embody that calm, safe, secure presence. So when we understand again, trauma is when stress happens to us mm -hmm. and we are consistently overwhelmed or without that ability to co-regulate or to find our way. I'm going to simplify all these concepts back into safety ourselves, mm -hmm. usually by relying on the presence of a safe and secure, physically present and emotionally safe and secure caregiver. We will carry that in the form of our neurobiological habits, mm. right? Which look like nervous system dysregulation in the body physiologically. And because the body and the mind are always communicating with each other, they'll look like the very practiced and repetitive assessments, meanings, yeah. ways that we're making sense of the world around us mm. or our beliefs, this kind of filter that we continue to put between us and the environment around us in terms of how we're perceiving certain events. Mm. And when the mind and the body are in communication, right? And my body is sending messages that I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not safe and secure. And then when my mind is filtering those messages through all of the reasons why I'm not safe and secure based in what happened or didn't happen in childhood, now we're stuck in this kind of feedback loop mm. that's going to impact our habitual behaviors, what we're doing in those moments of stress or reactivity. Mm. When many of us, I call it a rupture mood, when we're screaming and yelling and saying and doing the things that we don't mean to do because yeah. we're feeling unsafe, yeah. right? Or maybe we're distracting ourselves. Mm. We're keeping ourselves endlessly busy with tasks. I call this distractor mode, or we're just kind of scrolling on social media, right? Not fully because we're not safe in the present moment. So our attention is, is going somewhere else. Mm. Or as I discovered, maybe we're detaching completely. We're yeah. physically present, but mentally, I called it my spaceship, right? <laughs> we're a million miles away. Yeah. Um, or some of us go into a pleaser mode where we're tending to the world. We're hypervigilant to everyone else and their needs. We're not even focused on ourself at all. Yeah. And for a lot of us, that becomes our habitual way of being. And those modes are activated when we're stressed and mm. stress is caused, right? But when we're filtering the world through those old assigned meanings, and yeah. we'll stay locked in those cycles until of course we become conscious of what we're doing. And this is why I like to give language and names for all of these different moments in time so that we can begin to understand what's happening on a physiological level, right? Oh, I'm not feeling safe right now yeah. because in this moment, right? My mind is telling me that I'm not safe because someone doesn't love me or they're not caring for me in the way that I need to. Yeah. Now I have, I'm back in that conscious state of awareness where now I have the ability and opportunity to begin to make new choices, which have to operate again on both of those levels. Yeah. Learning how to physiologically calm my nervous systems, reactivity, so that it can go back into that calm ground and state of presence and learning to unhook from all of those old repetitive narratives about myself, about mm. other people, about my place in the my relationships or in the world around me. And then we can begin to make an opportunity, right? To, to view myself, my relationships in the world around me in a yeah. new way. That's really good. I was thinking about this part, this, this material in your book. And I was trying to think about like situations in my own life and uh, you can respond to this story if you want to, but um, in thinking about this, like all this stuff, I, growing up, like I had a, a, we'll say a significant male figure in my life who would repeatedly tell me that I didn't know what I was talking about, you know, that I'm never going to amount to anything. And I can remember as a kid, 
like nothing ever felt like it was enough for this person. Like if he asked me to give him a hundred percent and I gave him 110%, he'd make me feel like crap because I didn't give him 120%. Like I could never, I could never win. You know, like it never felt like anything I did was ever going to be enough. And so today, like whenever I find myself in a situation where I feel like I need to do something, I have to, I have to be on, like I have to perform in a certain way. I have to give my 100% best. I feel like inside I feel sick. Like I feel, I feel like I'm, I start, I literally start to sweat. Like I, sometimes I start to shake. Like I can't think straight. My mind is all over the place. It's like a ping pong ball in there because I, that voice inside is saying that no matter what you do, even if you give a hundred percent, it's not going to be enough. And like, I've only begun to accept. And I think this is the right terminology. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's a, like a trauma response. Like it's that younger, that younger version of myself, like freaking out in this present situation, because it reminds him of those past situations where he was hurt so badly by someone he so much wanted to trust and give himself to. So uh, that's my story. And I was wondering, like, does that type of thing fall in line with this type of material that we're talking about? 100%. Again, mm. having the significant caregiver mm -hmm. around us or whatever relation that it was, at that early point in time, you were dependent on them. Right. To be present to your, you know, whatever needs they were, physical or emotional. And through their presence or, or lack thereof, you began to define who you were. And a lot yeah. of us have that kind of merge definition of not being, right? I'm me and I'm lovable and I'm worthy of connection and love and support and relationship by just expressing myself, not by yeah. doing anything. And yeah. so many of us, right, when we're criticized, when it's never enough, when we're torn down and very much relating, Glenn, to your story, though, my mom in particular, my, you know, core caregiver, mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily critical of me, though she was largely emotionally absent mm -hmm. unless I was excelling academically or athletically, which was, you know, very evident that I did have the ability to excel in both of those areas very early. Mm -hmm. um, and there were slight moments. So meaning she would be emotionally detached unless I brought home all A's. Mm -hmm. If I brought home an A minus, right, I would get told some version of, well, why isn't it a hundred? Why isn't it an A, right? Otherwise she'd be emotionally detached. Similarly, I was, mm -hmm. softball was one of my, the sports that I mainly played. And She'd be celebrating me, right, when I was doing well, not necessarily criticizing me when I was doing poorly. So a lot of us, again, were so sensitive to that. Yeah. I, you know, very similar to you, began to define who I was based on what I was doing, which is not surprising then that I sought the highest degree in my field, the PhD, yeah. right, always seeking yeah. the next achievement. If I was still locked in that conditioned way of being, um, I have all these conditioned selves listed in my book and the one that I'm. I relate to the most is the overachiever. Yep. I would have collect, continued to collect letters after my name yeah. until I realized somewhere in my early thirties, because I had done that. I checked so many boxes of all of these achievements, right? The way that I learned to get my mom's focus of attention and yep. connection. She was present to me in those moments, yet I felt so empty, so yeah. unfulfilled. I wasn't able to. And for me, I even went through this cycle of shaming myself. Because I knew to the outward world, I had things that people didn't have. I had the PhD. I had the successful practice. I had the, you know, committed relationship. And so I would shame myself in that way of, well, why aren't you happy with what you have? Yeah. And the reality of it is, is because, you know, we're all seeking that deep feeling of being enough just as we are, not yeah. based on what we're doing or not doing, yeah. just in that pure self-expression. And so many of us, I think, continue these cycles. Some of us on the other end of the spectrum, it's not achieving, it's underachieving, yeah. right? Keeping ourselves in the backdrop, keeping ourselves so kind of out of any focus of attention because in childhood, that was the safest thing that we could do to maintain our connections. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, right, we're, when we're not just being who we are, living in our self-expression, we aren't going to feel fulfilled. Yeah. We're probably not going to feel connected to the relationships or the world around us yeah. because we're not. We are yeah. disconnected from that intrinsic and whole aspect of our being. So how do you begin? Like, how do you start to work through this stuff? I mean, obviously, you know, therapy is helpful. You wrote your amazing book that we talked about before, How to Meet Yourself, which can really, it's a workbook. So it helps you really identify a lot of different triggers and begin to process through some things. But like, what other things would you recommend to someone who's beginning to realize they have these different responses in their mind 
in their body, especially like when time is so limited, right? Because so many people that I know are working multiple jobs, you know, they're married, they have, they have kids, they've got mortgages to pay and all these different kinds of things. So how can like the everyday, maybe even overworked, overtired person begin to work through these things without saying like, oh, I'm going to get to it later when I have more time, because you know, as well as I do, there's never more time. You never get to it when you put it off. So what are some practical things today someone can start doing in those busy lives? The two simple, I simplify much mm -hmm. of what I, I talk about steps to changing yep. right? anything, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with other people, how mm -hmm. we're showing up in our self-expression. First step is always <clears throat> becoming conscious, mm -hmm. becoming right. It's a, it's a different state of our Wake brain up. awareness, yeah. becoming aware yeah. of those habits and patterns. And I want to celebrate everyone mm -hmm. out there listening who's becoming oftentimes painfully aware <laughs> of the habits and patterns that are driving their lives, because that is the first step that creates the opportunity in that now conscious space, not in that habitual autopilot mm -hmm. where we're just going about the motions. We almost feel like we can't control. We can't stop ourselves. Like we talked about earlier, yeah. that creates the opportunity to begin to take that second step, which yeah. is to make new choices. And even like you were sharing earlier, our brain with all of these neural networks, we have a sense of familiarity and therefore comfort in that autopilot habit way of being. Yeah. So becoming conscious is not only firing up physiologically a new, a new brain state, it's challenging us. It's taking yeah. us outside of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's really seeing clearly how we're impacting our, our own relationship and those of our loved ones and really the, the world around us. So yeah. really meaning when I say that to take a moment to celebrate because that's the first most important step of then making those new choices. And yeah. when we talk about anything we do that's new, any change that mm -hmm. we want to create, we have to understand how our nervous system works. While we're capable of incredible change, we now know that our minds and bodies, our minds are neuroplastic, our bios, bodies are bioplastic, which mm -hmm. simply means they can change throughout life. We can lay down some new neural networks. Mm -hmm. We can change our physiology and our state of emotional and physical health throughout the entirety of our lives. So mm. it's possible, though our nervous system prefers those forbid, those familiar habitual mm. patterns, the same ways we've always made sense of the world and the same ways we've always shown up in the world yeah. because it gains a false sense of safety in that, a sense mm. of control, right? I have these expectations, even if it's creating a, outcomes that I want to avoid to my nervous system, it's preferable than what could be present in the unknown. Mm. Right. So change is stressful to our bodies. So when we're becoming aware and we want to begin to make those new choices, I think it's really natural for a lot of us to want to overhaul our life from top to bottom, starting with, <laughs> you know, whatever we see, we need to change. We're just yeah. going to start doing everything different starting tomorrow. Yeah. And then if we're able to string together maybe a couple hours, a couple days of the new habit, inevitably most of us return right back to those yeah. familiar habits, oftentimes feeling more shameful, yeah. more upset with ourself, yeah. right? More even resigned to the possibility that maybe change isn't meant for me. Yeah. And again, going back to our nervous system, mm -hmm. one new small choice is going to challenge us outside of those familiar habits and patterns. Yeah. So when we overwhelm our system with stress, if we don't have the ability learned in childhood mm -hmm. to tolerate that amount of stress, it is inevitable physiologically that we're going to return right back into those old familiar habits. So fitting it into our very objectively busy lives mm -hmm. with endless obligations and people that many of you listening have to be and want to show up in care of. Yeah. It is physiologically beneficial to make and commit to those small daily in, in my circle, um, self healer circle, my global membership community. We have a mm -hmm. concept. We call it small daily promise mm -hmm. for that, for this purpose, right? Keep the promises small. Right? Yeah. Fit them into the day that you already have, the habits you already have. What do you do every morning or every mm -hmm. afternoon or every evening that you know you're going to do day in and day out? And then make that one moment where you're going to build another very small choice that will help you create that change. And then that stay committed and consistent with showing up for that new choice, knowing that it's going to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel that resistance in your mind and in your bodies, telling yourself, oh, that you're not changing. It's taking too long or feeling physiologically uncomfortable yeah. and wanting to go back to those habits and then remain committed because that's yeah. again, how change happens. I become conscious of what I'm doing or not doing. And then I stay committed to walking through and teaching my body how to deal with the stress of change in those mm -hmm. small ways every day. Yeah. And I think we can't underestimate that 
becoming conscious piece. I think that's a huge, huge thing because I was listening to a meditation teacher not that long ago, and he was talking about how in meditation, people tend to like beat themselves up when they realize they're getting distracted from their, whatever their focal point is. But it's like, don't do that because that, that moment that you realize that you've been in la la land for 20 minutes, he said, is when you realize that's you woke up, like you realized something. He said, now you have the decision you can make to go back to your grounding point again. And I think that in these situations, it's the same thing. Like you can be going on autopilot for 30 minutes, ranting and raving about whatever, because you're responding in a certain way. But then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing that thing again. Now you have that opportunity to pause, apologize, step back and start doing it differently. Beautiful. I could not yeah. agree more. I think that's such a, a wise teaching. And this also goes to to habits. The greatest yeah. gift, I, I would say, and I've lived the experience of going back to those old habits mm -hmm. is the opportunity in the moment where I made the choice to return to the new habits I've created. Yeah. And interestingly enough, the more times that cycle happened, keep, you know, stringing together those small new daily promises mm -hmm. for however many days it was, and then falling off the wagon, going right back to my old habits for however many days it was, and then having that moment of conscience. Oh, right. I want to do this new thing. Yeah. And then beginning to create, right. That new, new habit for however yeah. many days, and then going back what's, what's happening. Not only each time are we going into that new terrain, right. Making those new choices. Are we laying down some new neural networks mm -hmm. every time we've returned to our old habits and recommitted to our new ones? We're building self-trust. Yeah. And so many of us have lost that because we li are living driven yeah. by that blind autopilot and those moments of reactivity, feeling more and more shameful and incapable and disempowered over time. Yeah. Every time you have that beautiful moment right, of distraction and of that choice, that empowered choice to return, you're showing yourself that you can not only notice when you're doing the things that you want to stop doing or you know want to begin to do new things in those moments, you're giving yourself that ability to begin to trust yourself. Oh, right. I can show up in that empowered space. Yeah. I do have more choice than I've I felt many of us for a lifetime that yeah. I've had access to. So I would go as far to say is, and I spent many times in and out of new habits, um, <laughs> even to this day, you know, in periods like this where I'm podcasting, it's I have to remain committed in the mornings to keep my new daily habits of caring for my body because my old habits of worrying about work, of worrying about my to-do yeah. list, of diving yeah. right into emails yeah. are right at the ready. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't ever return to them. Of course I do. Mm -hmm. There's days and sometimes weeks where I worry about work before I worry about my physical body. Yeah. Though what is now different, I have trust in myself. Mm -hmm. I know that every opportunity, every new morning prov provides me, even every new moment provides me with a new opportunity to return to the choices that I know benefit me more. So let's say that you're, let's say you're in a relationship where you're, repeatedly triggered by, let's say, uh, maybe it's a, a partner, a spouse, maybe it's a boss, manager, and you're repeatedly triggered by a specific way like that they're acting or they're behaving or they're they're treating you. Uh, now, sometimes the, the other person might be at fault, right? Because sometimes they're really behaving in a way that's verbally or emotionally or, you know, God forbid, even physically abusive. But, and I'll be vulnerable here, but sometimes I know that for me, like I've come to realize that it's not always so much that the other person is being a certain way as much as it can be that it's my uh, like overreaction to their actions. Like I'm viewing them through like my trauma <laughs> goggles and it can very easily cause me to pass judgment on their intentions. But all that to say, like I asked, like, how can you know the difference? Because someone who has been through a lot and they're carrying a lot of trauma can assume I would think like one of two things, like the way I'm feeling is the other person's fault, right? Like it's, it's all Nicole's fault. Like she's toxic. She's the one who's the problem. Or it's the way that I'm feeling is all my fault because I've been taught to make everything is my fault. So obviously it's my fault. The other person has, you know, it's there. It's not them. It's me, that kind of thing. All the while, maybe the other person really is out of line and they do need to be confronted a little bit with their own, with their own issues. So what's the balance now? Like, how do you know in this whole conversation if it's all my baggage, the other person's baggage, it's a mix of different things. Like, how do you, how do you know? Like, what's the balance? To begin to figure out um, what's happening and ultimately what we need to do mm -hmm. in response to it. I think we first have to understand what emotions, right? Feelings are. Mm -hmm. um, and emotions are physiological, right? Shifts and changes that happen in our body 
that really are a function of our body, our nervous system in particular is kind of unconscious assessment mm -hmm. of the safety or lack thereof of the world, the relationship around me, right? In connection, of course, with our mind, mm -hmm. who's assigning the filter, the meaning to what's happening or not happening mm -hmm. to the world around me. And I'm very intentionally beginning with this because a lot of people do believe and don't have ownership of emotions, right? These mm -hmm. filters, as we talked about in the beginning, are coming from our own past experiences. The physiological sensations in our body, our nervous system's assessment of the safety or lack thereof, oftentimes is colored by the similarity that this experience is having to my past experiences where yeah. I was objectively not safe and secure. Yeah. So really simply, so many of us externalize, right? You caused me to feel in this way, right? Or you're not doing this made me feel, right? It's not to say that there's not other participants and an external environment around us. Sure. Though what really happened on a subconscious level is right, my physiolo physiology started to change mm -hmm. because I was assessing some version of similarity to some past experience. Now I'm becoming subjective, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, I'm assigning these filters and these meanings that are very subjective, you know, to my own past yeah. experience. And of course I'm having the feeling, I don't want anyone to hear me minimizing. Right. The emotion is real. Yeah. The shift and change in the physiology and then the habitual way that you're attempting to cope with it is real. It's mm -hmm. an objective, you know, reality in your body and in your mind in that moment. So mm. it is not right caused necessarily by anything outside of us. So mm -hmm. as we've been talking about becoming conscious, right? What is happening in my body? What is the meaning that my mind is assigning? The more you notice the same habitual meanings, right? Based in the same or coming from the same kind of sort of moment, mm -hmm. the same shifts in physiology. I talk a lot about the different states of nervous system that I mentioned earlier. And I offer a checklist uh, in the book in terms mm -hmm. of what that maps onto in terms of your body. Like how can I drop in and notice when I'm in that eruptor mode or when I'm in yeah. that detached or the distractor mode, right? So then I can make sense of what is mine. Now that's mm. not to say if an environment or a relationship is ultimately creating that threat-based reaction, right? Is making me feel unsafe mm -hmm. while it's right. Not necessarily, you know, kind of something we want to give away. We want to maintain our power by maintaining the choice to change that. Assuming that this person is going to be violating in whatever way, you know, and this isn't saying that we're responsible for their choices and their actions. Absolutely not. Yeah. But we can become responsible for putting and setting the boundary that we need to make yeah. sure that we're able to retain that safety, yeah. which might mean removing ourselves from that environment or from that relationship. But I think it is important to understand what emotions are um, because we're constructing them. So many of us day in and day out from our past experience, like you kind of acknowledge in yourself mm -hmm. based on what happened or didn't happen in our earliest relationships, filtering the world, and then continuing to keep ourselves stuck in those reactivity cycles. Yeah. And even though, again, no one can cause yeah. us to feel some way if we are unsafe in what is happening or not happening, yeah. then we can empower ourselves by saying, okay, I'm going to assume you're going to continue on as you are, and I can make new choices to find safety for myself. I was thinking that there, I used to work at Apple for like 11, 11 years. And we had a manager who was a really nice guy. But for whatever reason, this really nice guy would sometimes speak to me in a way that would activate all those things I told you about earlier, which made me like loathe working with him. Because whenever he was on the floor with me, like I just felt like I was not good enough. I was a top performer in the store, but like I felt like no matter what I do, it's not good enough. And so I literally went like months and months and months and say a word to him about it. And I was just stuffing it down and venting on my way home with the window open, <laughs> stuffing my face with donuts, eating my feelings kind of thing. But then one day I got up the nerve to talk to him. I actually watched one of your videos. I don't remember what it was, but it was on YouTube. It was like one of those short ones. And I watched it and I was like, you know, I'm going to have a conversation with this guy. And uh, my, I remember my hands were sweating and I was shaking. My inner child is like throwing up inside, but he ended up saying to me, he's like, dude, he's like, I, I would never want you to feel that way. Like, thank you so much for sharing it with me because, you know, now I can be more mindful of how my actions are impacting you. It's like, I would never want you to feel, I mean, think nothing of good things about you. And so it made me realize that like, wow, like I'm really filtering so much of my experiences through this person. He, he admitted, he goes, you know what? He said, I need to stop assuming that my humor is going to be taken a certain way when in reality, I might be hurting somebody. So this was really eye opening for me. So it was like a good conversation for him and for me. And I felt like both of us kind of stepped forward in our own individual lives, I think in a really good way. So, and that's, thank you, Glenn, for sharing that. Cause that's the reality. We are all assuming 
were yeah. interpreting, <laughs> right? Just as much as he was assuming that his yep. humor was landing in, in some kind of good hearted way, yep. you were assuming, right? What he meant or didn't mean by whatever it was that he was saying or not saying. Yep. And instead of, so it's really beautiful, those moments, again, not to say that, like I was sharing earlier, yes, our emotions are our responsibility, though, communicating, exactly. right? The circumstances, what's happening for us internally yeah. um, can open up. We're all living with such blinders on, right? Yeah. I can only assume you experience me in the way that I maybe intend for you to experience me. But I've had many moments where my loved ones have sat down and said, you're not coming off as, as you intend, right? right? This yeah. is how I'm receiving you in that moment. And of course, it's not to say that we let every opinion on social media kind of penetrate us and take it sure. on as our right. truth, though, those that are closest to us, you know, and that yeah. do have well-meaning intention for ourselves and individuals and for our relationship with them, it does benefit us and our relationships to hear someone else's perspective. Because in those yeah. moments, when I did that, when I tried it on for size, I said, okay, that's interesting, right? You're experiencing me as, as cold or as passive and many things I've been taught. I've yeah. told myself in these moments, I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be passive. Mm -hmm. Let me see for myself or passive aggressive usually is what I'm gifted <laughs> with. And, oh, let me see. Okay. I can see how yeah. You know, you're feeling distant from me in that moment because I am being distant or cold, or I can see how I'm yeah. not assertively communicating and I'm doing it in this more backhanded, snarky way. And then mm -hmm. I was able to expand even my blinded perception of me because of having a conversation and hearing, mm -hmm. um, both being right the giver of that information to my loved ones and then the receiver of different perspectives or experiences of myself. So good. All right. Last question for you. Um, you talk in the book about this idea that I, I had never heard before until I read it in your book about um, heart heart consciousness, which is kind of this idea of or not 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 heart consciousness. Heart consciousness leads off of heart brain coherence, is what I want to say. Heart brain coherence. And you talk about how this is when the I think the heart and the brain are like in alignment together. They work together. How that leads to uh, this discovery that you had of heart consciousness, which to me. In reading it, it sounds a lot like like maybe an idea of like intuition or like an inner knowing type thing. So how do these two things, I guess, work together? Then how can these two things aid us in our relationships, whether they be romantic or other? So just even going back to concepts, we we visit it mm -hmm. uh, in terms of this alignment, because right? I'm imagining listeners are like, what do you mean? My heart and brain are aligned. Yeah. <laughs> that way of being, right? That mm -hmm. unique fingerprint, that self-expression, right? If you were just to be yourself in any moment, say what's on your mind, right? Emotionally share yourself, express yourself in whatever way, right? We mm -hmm. could kind of define that as speaking, living, doing from your heart, yeah. right? Which is where I believe that unique, that we all have energetic self-expression. We wanted to map it onto a physiological organ. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it would be housed. Um, mm -hmm. I came to learn that our heart um, is actually really energetically powerful, even more so than our brain. Mm -hmm. The nervous system that we were talking about earlier with that's sending in electromagnetic information out to the environment and receiving it, our mm -hmm. heart is doing that outside of our awareness at a greater distance. So mm -hmm. alignment between the heart and brain, right, is I'm just myself in my daily day-to-day -day world and within my relationships. Yeah. Um, that is kind of just a, a simple definition of what that heart-brain coherence looks like. Mm -hmm. And so understanding when I'm living and being just truly who I am, I am more in a harmonious relationship mm. with myself. I'm not in that conditioned way of being. I'm not in that emotionally reactive way of being, right? Driven from the habits and patterns and the ways I learned to keep myself safe and secure. Yeah. I'm in that state of grounded presence. Mm. And when I'm, right, being who I am, now I set up the possibility and opportunity in my relationships Two, because my nervous system in that grounded state of safety and security, right, the ability to be me, I'm now setting up the opportunity for those around me and whatever relationship that I'm in with them to have the safety and the security communicated to them through those unseen signals, right, mm -hmm. from my heart sending out to theirs, yeah. that they're safer and secure to mm -hmm. express themselves. Mm -hmm. And now what we have is a recipe, not for the very conditioned relationships that most of us are operating in. Right, in for the more interdependent relationships that we're looking to be in, mm. where I'm me, again, really simplifying it, and you're you. Yeah. And I'm able to see all the differences between us because we're all different, unique individuals. I'm able yeah. to hold space for your unique perspective, for your different emotions. You might react differently to the certain circumstances than I would. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I'm able to then see you for who you are. 
So just like when we're in that state of heart brain coherence and we're sending out right those those signals, when our relationships and communities are in what's called a state of social coherence, when we have now this kind of generated state state of safety and the security, not only are our individual react interactions more harmonious, our communities yeah. become. And in the book, I cite um, a lot of what I think is the most empowering research of studies that they've done, um, mm -hmm. studying individuals who are kind of moving into these different states of alignment and connecting not even in physical presence, not even in the same room, mm -hmm. in kind of just energetic states where people across, you know, different cities, not even knowing each other are, you know, having moments of this kind of pure state of ground awareness. And mm -hmm. they've seen things like crime decrease in the neighboring cities at wartime. Another mm. really impactful study that I cite, they seen kind of wartime casualties decrease on those particular moments in time. So mm. alignment, the more we are each who we are and yeah. the more we create the opportunity. And that's what I, I hope is the biggest takeaway from my book is first the awareness that many yeah. of us are not ourselves. We're not in relationship and we're not in an authentic relationship with ourselves because we don't know what we think or what we feel. We're yeah. not honoring our own wants and needs. Yeah. We don't even know many of us into adulthood who we are, let alone how to be who we are, yeah. because at one time we couldn't, we didn't have that safety and the security. Mm -hmm. As we do that, we quite literally set ourselves up energetically for the opportunity to gift the world around us with that possibility to be more of who they are in the safe and secure partnerships that we all still need. We needed that in childhood. We need that until the day we die. We need community and connection. Yeah. But now we have the opportunity to be in those more authentic bonds or that state of interdependence. And it can kind of create these unseen ripples around the world, give, gifting others then with the opportunity to feel safer and more secure and more harmonious in their relationships. That is so good. Dr. Nicole, I could talk to you all day. I have so many more questions. I have so many more things from my life I want to ask you, but we are just about out of time. But thank you so much for making time for us. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I can't wait for people to get this book. Of course. Thank you as always, Glenn. I, I love these opportunities. I too could have continued to talk and thank you to your community and everyone who is tuning in. I, I say it wholeheartedly. I am so hopeful. Um, that there are, you know, so many people that are interested in in these topics, that looking at themselves in this new way, and are who are so committed, um, especially all the parents out there. I do want to give a special, you know, message to you: the ability to create change in your future generations is so huge. Yeah. And I'm just so I've, I'm chills. I'm so inspired by the many of you that have been walking this journey. Awesome. Uh, real quick, is there any place you want to point people to where they can do some? Whether you get the book, do some extra work with the book, anything like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so at the book, I have a website up, howtobeloveyouseek.com. It'll give you at least highlight several major retailers where you can hopefully purchase the book, though, whatever your major retailer of choices or your local bookstore, definitely give a call. They could possibly have it stocked. Um, on my website, theholisticpsychologist.com, I just recently released um, a version of a journaling practice. I created this journaling practice called Future Self Journaling what the, at the start of my journey, which really mm -hmm. capitalized on this, everything we talked about, becoming more <laughs> conscious to create yeah. daily new small choices. And I just put out an adapted version mm -hmm. for relationships. It's free of charge. So if you want to visit my website, theholisticpsychologist.com, you'll see a drop down to sign up for my email list and then you'll gain access. And I think that's a great kind of hand in hand resource if you do choose to buy the book and also a great standalone resource. Um, mm -hmm. It takes you through the whole process of future self journaling and what that could look like in terms of creating those small commitments yep. to change within our relationship. Then of course, while we're getting ready to end across all social media platforms at this point, <laughs> I'm having these conversations, I'm putting out these, this information and free resources and announcements yep. about them. So however it is that you like to consume content, come follow the holistic psychologist across that um, social media channel. And you'll have access not only to this information and conversation, but to the beautiful community. Awesome. I love it. I'll put the links in the show notes and we'll do it again someday soon. I look forward to it for the next secret project. That's, that's right. Stay tuned. <laughs> but after I take some breaks to stay grounded. That's right. Excellent. <laughs>